Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the Adventure and Mystery Book Club. I'm Bill Mallory, branch manager of the La Jolla Library. Um, I'm hoping you're seeing this because every once in a while when I start one of these things, it actually doesn't seem to start exactly when I'm thinking it's starting. So the little beginning part seems to get cut off sometimes. So <clears throat> hopefully this is uh, working for you. And uh, um, we are reading A War of the Worlds. So um, hopefully you're reading along. There's uh, lots of uh, copies that are out there since it's a classic. And because it's one of those few books that has never been out of print. There has never been a time since it was first published that it was, uh, that has ever been out of print. And it's always been in print in one form or another from its original publication in the 1890s to, to now. So uh, there are copies out there. You can go to Project Gutenberg and you can also uh, take a look at a, a copy of it for free online. Um, so, or on your on your tablet or a, a, an ebook, it's got a lot of different versions over there, so you can kind of uh, download specifically which uh, version works best for you. So, very good on that. Uh, hopefully, you're you're taking going going along with us on this. Um, all right, so uh, just a, a quick recap on what's happening right now. Uh, we are in the the second half of the book, and our unnamed protagonist is traveling with a man who is known only as the curate and he uh the two of them are in a building there they're uh the, the martians have come they are attacking the towns they are uh there's there's death and destruction society is kind of breaking down a little bit so there's a little bit of um uh, people misbehaving and uh and people are are kind of becoming a mob mentality in that sense. And so there's there's been a lot of descriptions of uh, man's inhumanity to man. And, uh, and now at this stage, um, we are looking at what Earth is like under Martian rule, if you will. Um, the cylinders are being rocketed from Mars, striking Earth, and the our narrator and the curate were in a house. They were searching these abandoned houses for supplies, food, and clothes, and tools. And uh, they leave one house, they go to the one next door, and right as they are going into the second house, one of the cylinders that transports the Martians from their home planet to Earth crashes into the house that they were just in. So they, they barely survive that by going into the next house and uh, this giant cylinder is now has now in a pit it's now it's, it's in a crater which has demolished the other house they they talk about how all this earth has uh, been pushed up against the the house next to it the house that they are in and it's coming through the windows and it's kind of knocked the house off its foundation a little bit and and now they're basically stuck because the um, other Martians in their tripod fighting machines have uh, have come to kind of help out and to kind of be there uh, for this new cylinder as it's it's getting ready uh, what they've also found is that there are two different kinds of of tripods that so there are some that are the the fighting tripods which have the heat ray and will release the black smoke that is is deadly on contact and uh, there are other kinds that are going around, walking around, collecting people. They're actually just reaching down with these articulated uh, mechanical tentacles. And when they see people there, they reach for them, they grab them, and they put them in a in like a basket in the back. And the reason for this is, is unknown. So, um, uh, however, one of the clues that we got from the previous chapter was that um, they have, the Martians are found to be a kind of race that uh, will absorb the blood of others. Uh, one of the things that they said in the last chapter was that uh, they have later found, when they were had a chance to examine the cylinders, they found a creature which was very human-like, but a, a native Martian creature, not like the kind of octopus-style 
of the Martians that are attacking, but some other kind of Martian that was sort of vaguely human shaped, which they basically used as food. They used they uh, drew the blood in um, to keep to sustain themselves. And and H. G. Wells kind of writes this little bit where he's kind of talking about how efficient they are in this, and that these Martians are basically all brain. And that their bodies are so efficient, they don't really need anything else. Um, so whereas we, he kind of describes us as being very inefficient, we take in food, and that food is then digested, and then the digestion gives us the building blocks to make blood ourselves. Well, now he's saying that these Martians are kind of cutting that that process out and just taking the blood directly, and they they don't they don't eat like we do. So he, it's, it's kind of an, an odd little passage as he's, as he's talking about this in the, in the previous chapter because he's sort of like, you know, talking about how great they are in the sense that they're very efficient that way instead of just being kind of vampire octopus creatures, which is how they appear. So anyway, a different kind of viewpoint there. Um, so bearing that in mind, and if you are ready... I see Arlene is ready. Hello, Arlene. Um, we're, we can start Chapter 3, which is entitled Days of Imprisonment. The arrival of the second fighting machine drove us from our peephole in the scullery, for we feared that from his elevation the Martian might see down upon us uh, behind our barrier. At a later date we began to feel less in danger of their eyes, for to an eye in the dazzle of the sunlight outside, our refuge must have been black, blank blackness. But at first, the slightest suggestion of approach drove us into the scullery in heart-throbbing retreat. Yet, terrible as was the danger we incurred, the attraction of peeping was, for uh, both of us, irresistible. And I recall now, with a sort of wonder, that in spite of the infinite danger in which we were between starvation and a still more terrible death, we could yet b struggle bitterly for all that horrible privilege of sight. We would race across the kitchen in a grotesque way between eagerness and the dread of making noise, and strike each other and thrust and kick within a few inches of exposure. In the fact is that we had absolutely incompatible dispositions and habits of thought and action, and our danger and isolation only accentuated the incompatibility. At Halliford, I had already come to hate the curate's trick of helpless exclamation, his stupid rigidity of mind. His endless muttering monologue vitiated every effort I made to think out a line of action and drive and drove me at times, thus pent up and intensified almost to the verge of craziness. He was as lacking in restraint as a silly woman. He would weep for hours to, uh, together, and I verily believe that uh, to the uh, very end, this spoiled child of life thought his weak tears in some way efficacious. And I would sit in the darkness, unable to keep my mind off him by reason of his in importunities. He ate more than I did, and it was in vain, I pointed out, that our only chance of life was to stop in the house until the Martians had done with their pit, and that during the long patience, a time might presently come when we should need food. He ate and drank impulsively in heavy meals at long intervals. He slept little. As the days wore on, his utter carelessness of any consideration so intensified our distress and danger that I had, much as I loathed doing it, to resort to threats and, at last, to blows. That brought him to reason, for a time. But he was one of those weak creatures, void of pride, timorous, anemic, hateful souls, full of shifty cunning, 
who face neither God nor man, who face not even themselves. It is disagreeable for me to recall and write these things, but I set them down that my story may lack nothing. Those who have escaped the dark and terrible aspects of life will find my brutality, my flash of rage, and our final tragedy easy enough to blame, for they know what is wrong as well as any, but not what is possible to tortured men. But those who have been under the shadows, who have gone down at last to elemental things, will have a wider charity. And while within we fought out our dark, dim contest of whispers, snatched food and drink, and gripping hands and blows outside in the pitiless sunlight of that terrible June, was the strange wonder, the unfamiliar routine of the Martians in the pit. Let me return to those first new experiences of mine. After a long time, I ventured back to the peephole, and find that the newcomers had been reinforced by the occupants of no fewer than three of the fighting machines. These last had brought with them certain fresh appliances that stood in an orderly manner about the cylinder. The second handling machine was now completed and was busied on the, uh, in serving one of, one of the novel contrivances the big machine had brought. This was a body resembling a milk can in its general form, about which oscillated a pear-shaped receptacle, and from which a stream of white powder flowed into a circular basin below. The oscillatory motion was imparted to this by one tentacle of the handling machine. With two spatulate hands, the handling machine was digging out and flinging masses of clay into the pear-shaped receptacle above, while with an <clears throat> another arm, it periodically opened a door and removed rusty and blackened clinkers from the middle part of the machine. Another steely tentacle directed the powder from the basin along a ribbed channel toward some receiver that was hidden from me by the mound of bluish dust. From this unseen receiver, a little thread of green smoke rose vertically into the air. As I looked, the handling machine, with a faint and musical clinking, extended, telescopic fashion, a tentacle that had been a moment before a mere blunt projection until its end was hidden behind the mound of clay. By another sound, it had lifted a bar of white aluminum into sight, untarnished as yet, and shining dazzlingly, and deposited it in a growing stack of bars that stood at the side of the pit. Between sunset and starlight, this dexterous machine must have made more than a hundred such bars out of the crude clay, and the mound of bluish dust rose steadily until it topped the side of the pit. The contrast between the swift and complex movements of these contrivances and the inert, panting clumsiness of their masters was acute, and for days I had to tell myself repeatedly that these latter were indeed the living of the two things. The curate had possession of the slit when I, the first men were brought to the pit. I was sitting below, huddled up, listening with all my ears. He made a sudden movement backward, and I, fearful that we were observed, crouched in a spasm of terror. He came sliding down the rubbish and crept beside me in the darkness, inarticulate, gesticulating, and, for a moment, I shared his panic. His gesture suggested a resignation of the slit, and after a little while, my curiosity gave me courage. I rose up, stepped across him, and clambered up to, uh, up to it. At first I could see no reason for his frantic behavior. The twilight had now come. The stars were faint, and little and faint, but the pit was illuminated by the flickering green face of uh, fire, rather, that came 
from the aluminum making. The whole picture was a flickering scheme of green gleams and shifting rusty black shadows strangely trying to the eyes. Over and through it all went the bars. Uh, I'm sorry. Over and through it all went the bats, heeding it, heeding it not at all. The sprawling Martians were no longer to be seen. The mound of blue-green powder had risen to cover them from sight. A fighting machine with its legs contracted, crumpled, and abbreviated stood across the corner of the pit, and then, amid the clangor of the machinery, came a drifting suspicion of human voices that I entertained at first only to dismiss. I crouched, watching this fighting machine closely, satisfying myself now for the first time that the hood did indeed contain a Martian. As the green flames lifted, I could see the oily gleam of its integument, its hide, it's also called a rind. Uh, I could see the oily gleam of his integument and the brightness of his eyes and suddenly i heard a yell and i and saw a long tentacle reaching over the shoulder of the machine to the little cage that hunched upon its back then something something struggling violently was lifted high against the sky a black vague enigma against the starlight as this black object came down again i saw by the green brightness that it was a man. For an instant, he was clearly visible. He was a stout, ruddy-aged, middle-aged... Uh, he was a... Okay, let's try this again. He was a stout, ruddy, middle-aged man, well-dressed. Three days before, he must have been walking the world a man of considerable consequence. I could see his staring eyes and gleams of light on his studs and watch chain. He vanished behind the mound, and for a moment there was silence. And then began a shrieking and a sustained and cheerful hooting from the Martians. I slid down the rubbish, struggled to my feet, clapped my hands over my ears, and bolted into the scullery. The curate, who had been crouching silently with his arms over his head, looked up as I passed, cried out quite loudly, at my desertion of him, and came running after me. That night we lurked in the scullery, balanced between our horror and the terrible fascination this peeping had, uh, had had for us. Although I felt an urgent need of action, I tried in vain to conceive some plan of escape. But during the second day I was able to consider our position with great clearness. The curate, I found, was qu quite incapable of dis uh, discussion. This new and culminating atrocity had robbed him of all vestiges of reason or forethought. Practically speaking, he had already sunk to the level of an animal. But as the saying goes, I gripped myself with both hands. It grew upon my mind, once I could face the facts, that, terrible as our position was, there was as yet no justification for absolute despair. Our chief chance lay in the possibility of the Martians making the pit nothing more than a temporary encampment. Or, even if they kept it permanently, they might not consider it necessary to guard it, and a chance of escape might be afforded us. I also weighed, very carefully, the possibility of our digging a way out in a direction away from the pit, but the chances of our emerging within sight of some sentinel fighting machine seemed at first too great. And I should have uh, had to do all the digging myself. The curate would certainly have failed me. It was on the third day, if my memory serves me right, that I saw the lad killed. It was the only occasion on which I actually saw the Martians feed. After that experience, I avoided the hole in the wall for the better part of a day. I went into the scullery, removed the door, and spent some hours digging with my hatchet 
as silently as possible. But when I had made a hole about a couple of feet deep, the loose earth collapsed noisily, and I did not dare continue. I lost heart and lay down on the scullery floor for a long time, having no spirit even to move. And after that I abandoned altogether the idea of escaping by excavation. It says much for the impression the Martians had made upon me that at first I entered little hope, little or no hope, of our escape being brought about by their overthrow through any human effort. But on the fourth or fifth night I heard a sound like heavy guns. It was very late in the night, and the moon was shining brightly. The Martians had taken away the excavating machine, and, save for a fighting machine that stood in the, in the remoter bank of the pit, and a handling machine that was buried out of, sight of, uh, out of my sight in a corner of the pit, immediately beneath my people the place was deserted by them. Except for the pale glow from the handling machine and the bars and patches of white moonlight, the pit was in darkness. And, but for the clicking and of the handling machine, quite still. The night had a beautiful serenity. Save for one planet, the moon seemed to have the sky to herself. I heard a dog howling and that familiar sound it was that made me listen. Then I heard quite distinctly a booming, exactly like the sound of great guns. Six distinct reports I counted, and after a long interval, six again. And that was all. And that is the end of Book 2, Chapter 3. Um, we have a little bit of time, so let's do Chapter 4, which is entitled... The Death of the Curate It was on the sixth day of our imprisonment that I peeped for the last time and presently found myself alone. Instead of keeping close to me and trying to oust me from the slit, the curate had gone back into the scullery. I was struck by a sudden thought. I went back quickly and quietly into the scullery. In the darkness, I heard the curate drinking. I snatched in the darkness, and my fingers caught a bottle of burgundy. For a few minutes there was a tussle. The bottle struck the floor and broke, and I desisted and rose. We stood, panting and threatening each other. In the end I planted myself between him and the food and told him of my determination to begin a discipline. I divided the food in the pantry into rations to last us ten days. I would not let him eat any more that day. In the afternoon, he made a feeble effort to get at the food. I had been dozing, but in an instant I was awake. All day and all night we sat face to face, I weary but resolute, and he weeping and complaining of his immediate hunger. It was, I know, a night and a day, but to me it seemed it seems now, an interminable length of time. And so our widened incompatibility ended at last in open conflict. For two vast days we struggled in undertones and wrestling contests. There were times when I beat and kicked him madly, times when I cajoled and persuaded him, and once I tried to bribe him with the last bottle of Burgundy. For there was a rainwater pump from which I could get water. But neither force nor kindness availed. He was indeed beyond reason. He would neither desist from his attacks on the food, nor from his noisy babbling to himself. The rudimentary precautions to keep our imprisonment endurable he would not observe. Slowly I began to realize the complete overthrow of his intelligence to perceive that my sole companion in this close and sickly darkness was a man insane. From certain vague memories, I'm inclined to think my own mind wandered at times. I had strange and hideous dreams whenever I slept. 
It sounded paradoxical, but I am inclined to think that the weakness and insanity of the curate warned me, braced me, and kept me a sane man. On the eighth day, he began to talk aloud, and nothing I could do would moderate his speech. It is just, O oh God, he would say over and over again. It is just. On me and mine be the punishment laid. We have sinned, we have fallen short. There was poverty, sorrow. The poor were trodden in the dust, and I held my peace. I preached acceptable folly. My God, what folly! When I could have stood, stood up through, uh, though I died for it, and called upon them to repent, repent! Oppressors of the poor and needy, the wine press of God. Then he would suddenly revert to the matter of the food I withheld from him, praying, begging, weeping, at last threatening. He began to raise his voice. I prayed him not to. He perceived a hold on me. He threatened. He would shout and bring the Martians upon us. For a time that scared me, but any concession would have shortened our chance of escape beyond estimating. I defied him, although I felt no assurance that he might not do this thing. But that day, at any rate, he did not. He talked with his voice rising slowly through the greater part of the eighth and ninth days. Threats and entreaties mingled with a torrent of half-sane and always frothy repentance for his vacant sham of God's service that made me pity him. He would sleep a while and then begin again with renewed strength so loudly that I must needs make him desist. Be still, I implored. He rose to his knees, for he had been sitting in the darkness near the, near the copper. I have been still too long, he said in a tone that must have reached the pit. I now, and now I must bear my witness. Woe unto this unfaithful city. Woe, woe, woe. Woe to the inhabitants of earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet. Shut up, I said, rising to my feet in a terror, lest the Martians should hear us. For God's sake! Nay, shouted the curate at the top of his voice, standing likewise and extending his arms. Speak! The word of the Lord is upon me! In three strides he was at the door leading into the kitchen. I must bear witness! I go! It has already been too long delayed! I put my hand, I put out my hand and felt the meat chopper hanging to the wall. In a flash, I was after him. I was fierce with fear. Before he was halfway across the kitchen, I had overtaken him. With one last touch of humanity, I turned the blade back and struck him with the butt. He went headlong forward and lay stretched on the ground. I stumbled over him and stood panting. He lay still. Suddenly I heard a noise without, and uh, I heard a noise without, the run and smash of slipping plaster, and the triangular aperture in the wall was darkened. I looked up and saw the lower surface of a handling machine coming slowly across the hole. One of its gripping limbs curled amid the debris Another limb appeared, feeling its way over the fallen beams. I stood, petrified, staring. Then I saw, through a sort of glass plate near the edge of the body, the face, as we may call it, and the large, dark eyes of a Martian, peering, and then a long, metallic snake of, a, of tentacle came feeling slowly through the hole. I turned by an effort, stumbled over the curate, and stopped at the scullery door. The tentacle now extended two yards or more into the room, and twisting and turning with queer, sudden movements this way and that. 
For a while I stood fascinated by that slow, fitful advance. Then, with a faint, hoarse cry, I forced myself across the scullery. I trembled violently. I could scarcely stand upright. I opened the door of the coal cellar and stood there in the darkness, staring at the faintly lit doorway into the kitchen and l listening. Had the Martians seen me? What was it doing now? Something was moving to and fro there very quickly. Every now and then it tapped against a wall or started on its movements with a faint metallic ringing, like the movements of keys on a split ring. Then a heavy body, I knew too well what, was dragged across the floor of the kitchen toward the opening. Irresistibly attracted, I crept to the door and peeped into the kitchen. In the triangle of bright outer sunlight, I saw the Martian in its briarious, briarious of a handling machine scrutinizing the curate's head. I'm going to pause here just for a moment. Uh, briarious is a Greek god. Uh, he is said to have 50 heads and 100 arms. So... In relating to that, he's basically relating to this giant, which has multiple arms, and uh, giving it a little bit of a, of a mythological reference there. I look it up so you don't have to. I thought at once that it would infer my presence from the mark of the blow I had given him. I crept back to the soul coal cellar, shut the door, and began to cover myself up as much as I could, and as noiselessly as possible in the darkness, among the firewood and coal therein. Every now and then I paused, rigid, to hear of the, um, if the Martian had thrust its tentacle through the opening again. Then the faint metallic jingle returned. I traced it slowly, feeling over the kitchen. Presently I heard it nearer, in the scullery, as I judged. I thought that its length might be insufficient to reach me. I prayed copiously. It passed, scraping faintly across the cellar door. An age of almost intolerable suspense intervened, and then I heard it fumbling at the latch. It had found the door. The Martians understood doors. It worried at the catch for a minute, perhaps, and then the door opened. In the darkness, I could just see the thing, like an elephant's trunk more than anything else, waving toward me and touching and examining the wall, the coal, wood, and ceiling. It was like a black worm swaying its blind head to and fro. Once it even touched the heel of my boot. I was on the verge of screaming. I bit my hand. For a time, the tentacle was silent. I could have fancied it had always it had been withdrawn. Presently, with an abrupt click, it gripped something. I thought it had me. It seemed to go out of the cellar again. For a minute, I was not sure. Apparently, it had taken a lump of coal to examine. I seized the opportunity of slightly shifting my position, which had become cramped and then listened. I whispered passionate prayers for safety. Then I heard the slow, deliberate sound creeping toward me again. Slowly, slowly, it drew near, scratching against the walls and tapping the furniture. While I was still doubtful, it rapped smartly against the cellar door and closed it. I heard it go into the pantry, the biscuit tins rattled and a bottle smashed, and then came a heavy bump against the cellar door. Then, silence that passed into an infinity of suspense. Had it gone? At last, I decided that it had. It came into the scullery no more, but I lay all the tenth day in the close darkness buried among coals and firewood, not daring even to crawl out for the drink for which I craved. 
It was the eleventh day before I ventured so far from my security. And that is the conclusion of Book 2, Chapter 4. So we're going to end it there um, with these two chapters, and we will go on to the next chapters to, um, um, I was going to say tomorrow, uh, but we're going to do it on Friday at 4 p.m. Um, thank you very much for joining me for the Adventure and Mystery uh, Book Club. Um, I hope you can join us again on Friday at 4 p.m. for the, uh, Chapter 5. And um, otherwise, uh, watch our Facebook uh, channel, our web Facebook page for more stuff. I'll, I'll usually add in some extra little, little things here and there on the off days. Um, so I hope you can check that out as well. Thank you very much for joining me. We'll see you on Friday. Take care, everyone.